prominent historical and mythical figures often serve as a potent symbol for whole nations. For the people of the British Isles, for example, tales such as those of King Arthur and the Round Table are almost universally known as part of that nation's soul. Many of these stories become so widespread and retold that their original meaning fades away, replaced by an idealized reflection of what once was. Perhaps the most iconic example of this type of heroic narrative is the tale of Mulan, China's beloved warrior heroine. Beyond just inspiring people in the land of her origin, Mulan has become a role model for breakers of the mold and young women across the planet. The question remains, what seeds did this legend grow from and how has it changed throughout the centuries? Welcome to our video on the famous Chinese legend of Mulan, its origins in the ancient past and how its legacy permeates into the 21st century. Since we will all be spending more time at home and with our PCs, we need to protect our browsing and personal info, and the sponsor of this video NordVPN provides the best way to do it. NordVPN is a VPN service that protects your communications and personal data, and most importantly, makes hacking close to impossible. It is important to keep our browsing info safe from the prying eyes of the ISPs, and NordVPN will do just that. It will also help you to stream or browse content even if it's not available in the country you're in. NordVPN has 5,500 super-fast servers located in 60 countries, and you can use it even in the countries where VPNs are banned. NordVPN never logs your data and protects your information in public spaces by using double data encryption. It works on Windows, Linux, iOS and Android, and has 24-7 customer support and a 30-day money-back guarantee. And most impressively, you can get all that for $3.49 per month. So what are you waiting for? Support us, get a free month of premium VPN, and save 70% at nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals or the link in the description. Don't forget to use the coupon code kingsandgenerals. Our first written account of China's most famous warrior woman comes from the anonymously written Mulan Shi, or Ballad of Mulan. Much like the Epic of Gilgamesh in Mesopotamian culture, it is possible that Mulan's tale filtered down through the generations in the oral tradition before being written down for the first time. The earliest known text of the ballad was gathered in a collection of poems and other similar works known as the Gujin Yuelu, the musical collection ancient and present. Little is known about the editor of this anthology, except his name, Ji Jiang, and his status as a Buddhist monk who lived in the mid-6th century. As for the Ballad of Mulan itself, early 12th century Chinese scholar Pan Zimu speculated that it originated during the Jin dynasty, which lasted from 317 to 439, while others believe it was created during the reign of the Liang dynasty in the early 6th century. We are likely to never know for sure but most agree it originated between 386 and 581. The narrative of the Ballad of Mulan is a familiar one to many Westerners of the 21st century, lacking many of the bells and whistles in Disney's famous adaptation, including the Li Shang love story and Mu Xu, the magical dragon in need of redemption. In the original piece, Mulan was a normal woman who lived with a typical family. She had an elder sister, a younger brother, as well as an elderly mother and father. When the ruler to whom her family owed fealty came to raise troops in the village, Mulan took her father's place as the family's military tithe, leaving the life of a woman behind. After purchasing a fine horse, a saddle and a bridle at the market, the daughter departs as the aging mother and father call after her. She then travels thousands of miles over the course of months and years, fighting over a hundred battles that are so fierce that their general dies. A decade of constant conflict against an unknown foe followed, after which Mulan was presented before her emperor in the imperial court. For bravery and courage, our protagonist was rewarded with riches, merits and positions, but Mulan declined. Instead, she was granted the right to return to her family leaving her comrades astonished that she was a lady the entire time. Although Milan is considered quintessentially Chinese, there is reason to believe that the ballad may have an origin outside of the ethnic Han core. 
specifically that it might have foreign beginnings in the northern periphery of Middle Kingdom territory. The Han dynasty's final collapse in 220 AD was followed by 300 long years of disunity, vicious civil war, fleeting imperial governance, and constant invasion from the outside. During the 4th century, China's collapsing Jin dynasty resulted in the takeover of almost all of northern China by barbarian peoples and began the Sixteen Kingdoms period. Almost a century of warfare, upheaval and destruction followed, during which the region's population suffered terribly until finally, in 386, a Shanbei clan known as the Tuoba brought the north under central control and established the state of Northern Wei. This vibrant young dynasty placed traditionally Han lands under foreign control for the first time. It also waged wars against other nomadic people known as the Roran, the likely inspiration for Bori Khan, a character in the upcoming 2020 live-action film. The Shanbei were people similar in character to some of China's more recognizable neighbors, including the earlier Xiongnu and the later Mongols. That is to say, they were a nomadic group whose population, both male and female, were trained in horsemanship and archery from an early age. Because of this, it can be speculated that the Ballad of Mulan originated as a folk tale somewhere in a post-invasion north, a milieu in which the fable of a warrior woman galloping on horseback and fighting in wars would have been more familiar to the tribal but increasingly sinicized population. The ballad's enigmatic author probably drew from and expanded an orally recited story which was centuries old, transcribing his Ballad of Mulan in an instance of fusion between two cultures, Han and Nomad, which were mingling with one another. As the Chinese literary historian Hu Shi put it, the new peoples of the north encouraged a military spirit and were fond of bravery, and therefore the folk literature of the north naturally carries such a heroic quality. In Luo Guanzhong's Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it is written that the empire once divided must unite. That statement proved correct in the early 7th century, when Li Wan took China's dragon throne for himself, becoming the first Tang emperor, Gao Zhu, and kickstarting an era of cultural vibrancy and intellectual brilliance. The age-old story of Mulan inspired many artists, composers and poets of the Tang era, and was built upon by those same individuals. It was during this period that the original Ballad of Mulan was explored and fleshed out for themes and lessons for the first time. One of the famous scholar bureaucrats of Chang'an's imperial court was a man named Wei Yuanfu, a Tang court official and accomplished poet who composed the so-called Mulan Ge, or Song of Mulan. Although this piece of work imitated the original ballad in form, Wei's polished style distinguished the song as a truly sophisticated piece of art, rather than a mere folk tale. The various details included by this imperial courtier serve to emphasize certain aspects of Mulan's character, specifically her exemplary loyalty and Confucian filial piety. In Wei's rendition, for example, the young lady's father was not only unfit for military service due to his age, but also because of a debilitating illness which he suffered from. Moreover, his description of how the northern wind cuts open people's skin also showed just how terribly Mulan's father would have suffered had his daughter not stepped up to the task by temporarily discarding her womanly role. After traveling with the army from snowy mountains to green seas and back, victory was attained against the Chang people by ambush and Mulan returned home. Wei Yuan Fu concluded by posing the rhetorical question, how could such a woman, who served as such a fantastic example of what a dutiful lady should be, be forgotten even after thousands of years? The implication that contemporary women should try to imitate Mulan's virtues is clear to see. A dizzying array of other Tang literati contributed to the growth of her legend, in addition to Wei Yuan Fu, including Du Mu with his short four-line poem and many, many others too numerous to list here. Although dedicating poems specifically about Mulan seems to have been incredibly popular during the Tang dynasty, its influence also seeped into the wider cultural consciousness, seeping into unrelated works throughout the period. 
A scholar called Bai Zhu Yi, for instance, referred to Mulan's feminine beauty in order to color his description of a magnolia flower in a poem playfully dedicated to magnolia. If this specific topic of dedication seems quite odd, it is worth noting that Chinese poetry is often beautifully dedicated to such mundane things as sunsets, snow, and in our case, flowers. The other side of Luo Guanzhong's proverb, that the empire united must divide, came to pass in the early 900s, when the Great Tang finally collapsed into a brief period of disunity. They were quickly succeeded in their imperial role by the Song, who themselves were beset by repeated threats of northern conquest by dynasties such as the Liao and Jin. This nomadic storm finally broke at the start of the 1200s, when Genghis Khan's Mongol juggernaut conquered much of Eurasia, before splintering into pieces later in the century. One of those segments was Kublai's newly Mongol China, known to us as the Yuan. The Mongol dynasty's scorn for Han bureaucrats pushed many in China's traditional scholar class deeper into cultural works, many of which criticized the Yuan emperors, their ways of ruling, and their failures. A poet of this era, known as Yang Weizhen, composed another Mulan Shi, which acted as a piece of satire against the emperors. It implied that if the ruler was doing their job properly, advancing the loyal and good whilst controlling the barbarians, a woman such as Mulan would not even be forced to carry weapons in the first place. In addition to its function as an inspirational folktale, the centuries had allowed Mulan to become a vessel to criticize those in power. As China's Mandate of Heaven was passed down throughout the second millennium, first from Yuan to Ming, and then around three centuries later from Ming to Qing, the story of Mulan continued to serve as one of the Middle Kingdom's greatest cultural achievements. Brilliant pieces of art were dedicated to her journey, shrines were built in her honor, and different locations, including Huayuantou and Wanzhou, even competed to be Mulan's place of origin. So great was the pride associated with the ballad and its successors. Even today, we can imagine Chinese families putting their children to bed with the ballad or its many offshoots and developments, just as parents in the West and elsewhere might use myths from their own history for the same purpose. Mulan also began gaining notoriety and popularity in foreign lands far earlier than might be expected. The first time we can see its mark on an outside work is in 12th century Korea, when Mulan was compared to Sol Xin Yeo, a similar female hero of Korean history. Although we only have documented evidence that this time period was the ballad's first instance of proliferation, the incredibly close cultural link between the Jupiter of the East and its neighbors in Korea, Japan, and other nearby regions suggests that Mulan was probably spread far earlier than this, maybe even during Tang times. However common it was in China's direct sphere of influence, the story only began appearing in the Western world during the late 1800s, when translations of Chinese texts first became available. In America, Mulan was introduced by a group of Chinese students studying at Columbia University during the 1920s, who performed a play based on the ballad. In the United States, as in Yuan China, Mulan was used as the vessel for a political message more than once. During the interwar period, for instance, left-wing Chinese-American playwright H.T. Tsang produced China Marches On, a play featuring Mulan with the goal of educating American workers about brutal Japanese imperialism in his mother country. The metamorphosis of Mulan's potentially two millennia old story climax with Disney's interpretation in 1998. Both widely acclaimed for its narrative quality and critiqued for its perceived orientalism, Mulan is one of Disney's greatest works. As Professor Joseph Chan tells us about Mulan's state in the modern day, Mulan is not genuinely Chinese, nor is it all American. It has become a transcultural text, a combination of old and new, traditional and modern, East and West, collectivism and individualism, female submissiveness and women's liberation, filial piety and reciprocal love between father and daughter. No doubt Disney's upcoming remake will continue the ever-advancing evolution of a story that originated in the mists of China's ancient past. We always have more stories to tell, 
so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.